Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's hard to say this, but summer's drawing to a close. And so as you start thinking about back to school time, football season's on the way, different things, you like to reflect back on the summer and some of the things that perhaps you were able to do. The highlight, I would say, of my summer was the 4th of July weekend. You know, it fell on a Thursday, so I'm sure communities were, were partying and having festivals for Wednesday to Saturday uh, to celebrate our independence. Played a little golf with my son, went to a parade, went to a pool party at a friend's house, went to see fireworks, hosted people at my house, and then had a chance to preach on Sunday morning. Now that is a full and awesome weekend for a pastor. When you go to the, when you go to the parade though, there's just something special about a community gathering together. And at the front of the parade, we always have the flag, right? And we have our veterans that march that flag down the center of the street. And for the young people who might not understand, um, we who are a little more mature, you know, coax them and tell them to stand up in respect for the flag, take off your hat, and give honor where it is due. We pledge our allegiance to that flag. And some still do it in schools, some choose not to. And so when we look at it, it's, well, what are we supposed to do? What is the right answer? As Christians, we are often asked, where do you pledge your allegiance? Who do you, who do you pledge your allegiance to? Is it the state and the, the governors of our, of our laws, the people who make sure that we abide by them? Or are we beholden only to one? To whom do we pledge our allegiance? Well, dear friends, I would pray that our allegiance goes to our one and only Savior. The one who, is, who gave himself up for us. Who changed our status before God. Who gives us comfort and hope and peace that no matter what is going on in our world, that Jesus still reigns. And that he rules our hearts and lives for our benefit and for the people that we come into contact. Now Jesus really was asking a very similar question in our text for today. But before we get to that, if you were to look at the rest of Luke chapter 9, you would see two pretty spectacular events. Number one, Jesus sends out his followers, his disciples... And they are able to do great things. They are able to heal people. They are able to drive out demons. And they come back and they are on fire. You would believe what we were able to do. And, and it wasn't because of them. It wasn't because they were so great or they were so faithful. It was because they had the power of Jesus going behind, behind them. And so in this way, Jesus is laying the groundwork and the foundation. Here are the things that are going to happen during the course of my ministry, but you are going to see even greater things. Shortly after that, we have the feeding of 5,000. Just small amount of bread, small amount of fish, and yet Jesus tells his disciples to, to break it up, pass it out, and there is enough to feed 5,000 men, some translations have. And then that's women and children over and above that. And there were still leftovers that were gathered after that. So it's with that background that Jesus has this little discourse with his disciples. And he asks the questions, who do people say I am? And they replied, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and still others, that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. My Bible's a little different translation than the one that's on the sheet that was in your table. 
Um, so John the Baptist, he had just lost his head, literally. He had pointed out the sin of Herod, and so Herod, in a moment of weakness, was willing to give his stepdaughter whatever wish she wanted, and her mother asked for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And so since he had come and was speaking with power and authority, people were thinking, maybe John the Baptist, who has just died, has already come back to life and now is able to do all these awesome things. But Jesus wasn't John the Baptist. Some were saying, Elijah. And why would Elijah have a place of prominence? Well, because Elijah never died. He was taken up in a, in a chariot of fire right before the eyes of his protege, Elisha, and taken straight into heaven. So if somebody's able to do these awesome and miraculous things, it's probably the guy who never died. But Jesus wasn't Elijah. And others had said, maybe some of those ancient prophets, the ones who came before us hundreds of years before, guys like Isaiah and Jeremiah, who begged and pleaded with the children of Israel, turn your hearts and your lives and focus on God's promise. Listen to the one true God who loves you and is going to fulfill the promise of the Messiah. And yet Jesus wasn't any of the prophets. And so it was interesting. He kind of left that all out there. Who do the people say I am? And then in the next statement, Jesus really is asking, who do you pledge your allegiance to? How about you guys, who are my inner circle, who have heard me preach and teach, who have prayed along with me, who have seen some of the miracles, what about you? And the Apostle Peter, bold Peter, occasionally, said the Christ of God. This newer translation says God's Messiah. And no matter what word you use, Christ or Messiah, it means the exact same thing. The Old Testament Hebrew word, Messiah, the New Testament Greek word, Christo, Christ, both mean God's anointed one. The one whom God had promised all the way back in the Garden of Eden when perfection was first shattered. And the one who God promised over and over and over again throughout the generations up to the time of Peter. And so matter, no matter how you look at it, Messiah or Christ, Peter is saying, you are the one we've been waiting for. And what does Jesus do? He says, Shh. We've just seen the miracles. We've, we've seen people who have been healed. We've driven out the demons. We, see, we have seen the great feeding of all of the masses. And now you want us to shh. Because Jesus knew what it meant for God's people to be the Messiah. And he knew what was in their hearts. When God established his plan of salvation, it was to be the Messiah, the one who would change souls. To say, this is the one who has come to shed his blood. You know, all of those things that you've been doing since the time of Moses for 1,500 years. The slaughtering of all the animals, all the sacrifices you've been doing. They've all been leading up to me. But people were a little confused about what being the Messiah meant. For so many of them, it meant the person who was going to rescue them from the Roman persecution. They were ruling, and they were heavy-handed, and they didn't respect the one true God, and they didn't respect the worship of the Israelites. And so they were constantly waiting since the time of David, a thousand years before Jesus, to be restored and renewed, to be a powerful and strong nation. And this guy looks like the one we've been waiting for. So in that moment when Peter says, you are the Christ of God, you are God's Messiah, Jesus wanted to make sure that there was no confusion as to who he was that he came not to establish an earthly kingdom, 
but the Messiah who came to establish the spiritual king. Among the people of the Old Testament who had looked forward to the coming of the promise, to be the visual for those people living in that time. And now Jesus is the one that we turn back to in the pages of Scripture and see. But I think the question is still prevalent. Who do you pledge your allegiance to? Satan will whisper in our ears and deceive us and try to lead us to listen to him, to follow the ways of the world. What happened way back in the Garden of Eden? Eden, there was deception. Satan said, God is holding things out from you, Eve. Did God really say, does God really love you? And it led to doubt in that first sin. And don't we oftentimes, when we fail, face hardships and difficulties, that we listen to Satan who is trying to deceive us and lead us away from the truth, to lead us away from the promise, to take us away from God's Messiah, the Christ of God, to throw up our hands and to, and to forsake all of the things that, we've been, that we have cherished and that we have heard. Who you pledge your allegiance to. It's often difficult to watch what's going on around us, to look at the world and, and not be confused and wonder, does, does God really have it all right? Is God really that smart? Shouldn't we just be doing the things that make us feel good like the rest of the world does? Wouldn't it be better for us simply to just blend in with the rest of the world and no matter what sins they commit or no matter what they think is cultural change it's not worth the argument that we mute ourselves and that we shy away who do you pledge your allegiance to i know all too often i pledge allegiance to my own heart because by nature, I am selfish. By nature, I want it the way I like it. And no one's going to talk me out of it, and no one's going to make it different. Now today, it's pretty early, and so all I did was come to church today, so far. So I really haven't had an opportunity to be a blatant, outright sinner. I haven't done something vile and hostile. I haven't spoke harshly with anyone. My thoughts, sometimes they wander and they fade and they go in different places where they perhaps shouldn't. But that's the way we are. Our natural inclination is to serve ourselves. And we pledge our allegiance to ourselves. This is who I am. Here I stand. But the question that Jesus asked the disciples is for us too. And I would pray that we would say, where do we pledge our allegiance? That it is in Jesus. That the banner of Christ goes ahead of our eyes and we follow it. And we stand in reverence and holy awe, just like we do for the flag when it goes down the street on the 4th of July. We stand for prayers. We stand and marvel at all of the wonderful things that God has done for us. We raise our hearts and our voices in praise of him, thanking him for all of the wonderful things he has done for us. And most importantly, that he's called us to faith. Whether it's through the waters of baptism, when you were about this big, or whether you just learned about Jesus when you were 20 or 40 or 60, that the word continues to resonate and work in your hearts that we pledge our allegiance in a Jesus who is willing to leave the comforts of heaven, to come down, to live amongst the people who want him dead. He was willing to die. He lived the perfect life that we couldn't in order for it to be credited to us. He died so that animals wouldn't have to die anymore, and we wouldn't have to die spiritually dead either. 
Because in his glorious resurrection, he made everything new. He told everyone to stand up, to focus their eyes on him. And we still do that today. But at that time, Jesus told the disciples to shh, because he knew what was yet to come. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. I'm not a king for the world. I'm a king for time and eternity, and I'm going to have to do this. And if there's more people who are going to fight for me and step in my way and there's going to be this huge army, it's not going to work out according to God's plan. So don't tell anyone. But he tells his disciples of today to go and make more disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So the shush is over. And now it's time for us to be willing to share that message with more and more people. Whenever I show up at a place where I'm, where I'm uh, filling in as a preacher, you always have to read the bulletin, the newsletter, find out what's shaking. Looks like we've, we're doing mission work in Wasaki. We're going to a place where we don't have a, a presence and we are sharing Jesus in that place. We're doing things in the community that make a difference. And they may resonate with individuals who see what we do, but we're doing it out of love for each other and fellowshipping, love for our God who's given us our ability and then love for other souls. So whether you're in the moms group that invites a fellow mom, whether you are Bible and bowling together, whether you are at the county fair, or whether you are tubing, all of these things are an opportunity to say, I pledge my allegiance to my Savior. And it all comes clear when Jesus says, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. It isn't all about Jesus saying, do these certain things and you will live. He's saying the fruits of faith will be evident. That you are willing to lay your life down for me just as, like, just as I have come into the world to lay down my life for you. You may have thought it odd that I selected Abide With Me as the sermon. Usually it's in the evening. Many times it's sung at funerals. But verse 4 just really resonates with me when it talks about the days of my youth and the fact that I, you haven't left me as oft as I've left thee. I realize that I've pledged my allegiance to the wrong things, to the things that I see and the things that I can do, that I haven't always pledged my allegiance to Christ. And so that hymn offers me comfort and relief, that Jesus has remained my friend throughout the course of my life, and that I've got, I have the privilege to not only see in his word that Jesus laid down his life, but I have the privilege of sharing that with others. So dear friends, my encouragement is that we live in our faith every single day. That it isn't just on Sunday morning when we have the Christian flag standing in front of us. That it isn't just when we're in the comfort of studying the Bible. But that we pledge our allegiance to our God each and every day. We rejoice in his mercy, that we extend his kingdom, and that we give glory to him. Abide with me, Jesus. You've called me to be your own. Now, let's go out there and show to whom we pledge our allegiance, Jesus our Savior. Please stand. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Amen. We're going to continue with the Create in Me, found on page 20 in the front of our hand. Please be seated. At this time, we have an opportunity to continue. 